Outrocast. Well, it's a pleasure to be speaking with you. The first question I have is, do I call you Jihad Jerry, Red <laughs> Jerry, Gerald? What do you like to be called? Well, you know, JJ didn't get the love, so uh, you could just call me Jerry. Well, <laughs> I'll call you Jerry with a G today. And uh, you again, thank you for your time. Fan of your work for decades now. And you never stop making headlines. And by that, I mean... There was the great press release last week about Whippet finally getting the double platinum certification, yeah. the awards. There's your new boundary breaking music video, which is in new dimensions, et cetera. Uh, so what are we here to talk about first? The the video that you directed? Well, you know, I <clears throat> I do what I can, right? Um, with Devo on ice year after year, I started just doing what I could when I could with the resources I had available. And you know that, I mean, from the beginning, Debo was a multimedia concept on purpose. And I, yeah. I directed 99% of our videos and then started directing music videos for other bands, you know, 60 oh, or yeah. 70 other bands. And, and then I started doing commercials. And I never stopped loving, you know, doing visual work, right? So w Debo was always employing the latest technology insofar that we could afford it or get opportunities to use it. We were using composites and CGI early on, like by 81 and 82, we were doing that. And um, this whole world of uh, this meta world of, uh, you know, immersive uh, interactive experiences and 3D, 3D immersion uh, really excites me, you know, because if there was any band that should be doing something in that space, it's Devo because yeah. we have a whole world view. We have characters, we have a narrative, we can tell a story so that it's not just throw away, you know, effects or silliness. It's like you could enter this world and get involved totally with a, a devolved scenario that you're, you're a character in this world. Right. And mm -hmm. that's what I wanted to do. And very few people in that world came to Devo because they're always looking at multi-platinum artists like Kiss or something or ABBA, because if they're going to spend a hundred million bucks, they just want that security of, oh, this band sold all these records, you know. And unfortunately, Devo should be getting the opportunities that Kiss and ABBA get, but we don't. And when we do... It comes from maybe second tier people or more experimental people, right? You know, um, in other words, the percentages aren't as high. And uh, the company 4D that I worked with was, mm -hmm. they, it came to Devo, but I couldn't get Mark or Bob or anybody in Devo interested or to even come to the studio in Culver City and see these people, right? They just, kind of blew them off so i went alone because i'm still gonna be excited about this stuff and yeah. they said hey they said hey we'll shoot a demo with you to show people how this world could work but then you have to let us put something out at some point that's a teaser it won't really be the 3d immersive experience with the oculus headset it will be a, a fly through that simulates what a user might do had they entered that space right mm -hmm. so it's it's just a a pale facsimile but i you know i did what i could with uh my my new love of doing uh lounge versions of my songs and uh and and i personally i experienced there uh what it would be like because they were able to um give me a demo although they haven't spent the money rendering the resources yet. Everything there exists, data-wise, everything. You, It's a complete world, and this is just a teaser. And in fact, the uh, the kind of dome-like temple, you know, the Tower of Babel that you enter at the end that ends up exploding, there's a whole thing going on in there that they have not yet rendered at all. And so someday <laughs> you'll be able to enter that that world and see that performance with the dancers and Josh Freeze 
and Steve Bartek and me and the temple in the real way that you or anybody else could experience it, where you could go anywhere you want at any moment you want, any focal length, any any angle, and be in it. And it's almost nauseating when you're in it. It's like um, <laughs> it's like vertigo or motion sickness. It, sure. You don't feel the ground, and you really feel you're out of reality. Like you're not in a room, right? You're you're in that place. You're in the metaverse. So of course I love that. That's a long answer. And I think Devo should be avatars. Yes, I do. I think because that would make us immortal. And then we could continue telling these stories and making new music. And it would be, you know, us once removed from the mortal flesh. <laughs> well, kudos to all that. I love a lot of the choices that Devo has made. For example, I love, and I, uh, I don't know how you feel about it, but Devo 2.0 and since then, a few of them have become stars in their own right. Uh, Kane, right. acting credits. He's currently yeah. on the road with Haim, et cetera. You have a Hunger Games actress and all that. Do you look back on that project favorably? I do, because uh, even though Disney, the company, actually ended up taking a poop on that project because... They were only interested in high school musical. Yeah. It, it, it came through a, a guy at Hollywood Records, you know, totally associated with Disney. It was his idea. And they let him run with it. And then after we did it, they were like, mm, we're not promoting this. We're promoting high school musical. But I worked hard on that. I, I spent uh, two and a half months casting. Mm -hmm. And then another three or four weeks rehearsing the band, they could actually play. Mm -hmm. So we brought them into Mutato Studios and they actually, some of them played their instruments. Of course, some of us played parts for them. Right. Uh, the, the, the kids sang their own bits. They're all, that's all their voices. And, uh, and then I, I went on a mini like six city tour uh, on the East and West coast with, with those kids live with the video backdrops in sync the way Devo did in 1982, right? And they got a really good response. I mean, the, the middle school kids that that they were playing to loved it and related to them, right? <laughs> it could have been big. And um, I regret nothing about doing it. I think it was solid. And I think if Disney hadn't you know, shelved it basically, I think it could have gone pretty far. But yeah. that's that's the usual fate of Devo is like, uh, you know, pioneers who get scalped. It was like all that effort, but it was kind of not embraced by the gatekeepers and it was ahead of its time. Uh, and so there you go. Well, to add on to that, having worked in management around that time, They Might Be Giants had their albums on Disney's kids' mm -hmm label mm -hmm. and they had a thing or two get shelved they had a tour they were ready to go out on get canceled at the 11th hour so it sounds like right. Devo's not the only counterculture act that disney <laughs> changed some plans on at that time yeah yeah and as a matter of fact it was the same person and i'm so sorry that i'm you know um touching it, on joe biden's dementia here uh i can't remember his name it was, was the same it david person. agnew that's it yeah. thank you David Agnew was he, he because because of they might be giants he came to Devo. Oh wow! Okay, yeah. that makes a lot of sense right there. Because... And and he didn't have an idea. He just said, "I want you to do something with with us, you know, where we repurpose your content for middle schoolers." And I came up with that idea. I said, "Well, uh, why don't we do Devo 2.0 and I'll 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 make a band." And so, he loved that idea. And he was totally supportive. And he, he um, you know, he threw the necessary uh, funds at at what it took to, to put that band together. So it makes you think in a way, now Devo beat Kiss and ABBA to the 2.0 punch. But was <laughs> there, before they settled on the avatars, was there a Kiss kids band happening, an ABBA kids band happening? Possibly. 
Yeah, I wouldn't know. Yeah, possibly. <laughs> yeah, so, I so there, were, there were kiss midgets. Yeah. Uh, little people. Yes, many kids. Actually, they weren't midgets because midgets are perfectly formed humans proportionately, but just shrunken in, in scale. They were dwarves, and dwarves are a whole other thing, as we know. Yeah, the the insult that has emerged from all of that that we don't fully understand, but we're told you can't say this, but we don't know why. Whatever it is. Back to you. Yeah, no. <laughs> so, well, if you're not a dwarf or a midget, you can't talk about it. <laughs> having just written a book about david lee roth who for a while was employing little people to be his security detail for everyone to see you don't know what the correct vernacular is anymore so <laughs> no certainly um, not um yeah as as the identity politics took over it's like unless you're a member of whatever disenfranchised or marginalized group we're talking about you are not even allowed to create the the definition, the the vernacular, the nomenclature, whatever. You're not allowed to. That's that's how it is, you know. So uh, if I can keep the compliments coming here, I'm <laughs> fascinated with how on board Warner Music Group is in promoting your catalog because you're one of those bands that was huge. Then the albums did not happen the way that the label wanted. You part ways. Right. And then all of a sudden you're licensing gold and everybody wants to be in business with Devo. When did you start to notice that you were friends with Warner Music Group again? Well, as soon as they saw us being able to license our songs to TV commercials and movies uh, in a robust way, right? They went, oh, maybe those guys weren't losers. <laughs> yeah. You know, because once again, you're right. We Devo should have been huge, but we weren't embraced at radio. Oh, you the, were huge. I'm going to rudely interrupt. And I'm going to say Devo was huge because just from the I, I never alone, we <laughs> we never made money except whip it. I mean, we never. Oh, know. that's an interesting perspective I didn't think about. But anyway, I interrupted you. So they once okay. they saw the catalog and the licensing stuff happen, then they got you on speed dial. Yeah, I was like, oh, yeah, you know, we uh, we still participate in that catalog. And then, of course, what happened was that um, it, it, the, the Copyright Reversion Act kicked in, but only for the United States, um, where finally artists got their uh, songs back after 30 years, regardless of whatever the deals they had signed were. Yeah. because the deals were onerous. So that made Warner all the more kind of, um, you know, uh, what's on point and urgent about doing what they could while they could before these songs reverted because it would revert one album at a time given when the album was released. And then finally, we got back our whole catalog hmm. for the U.S. Wow, I don't think the average person realizes the catalog reversion that happened for you guys. So I'm glad to hear that on, on that end. Now, with with Warner Brothers at the peak of Whip It, Van Halen was kind of the priority band as far as, yeah. you know, I can tell from being an outsider. Did you have any run-ins with Van Halen around that time? No, no, we didn't. In fact, I I, I think I only met David Lee Roth in passing back then. I never met any of the other guys in the band. We never were in the same event at the same time in the same room. Uh, it just didn't happen. Uh, I think the only time I heard anything was uh, we, you know, we were shooting a lot of interstitial video to show in concert with this nefarious character, Rod Ruder, that represented the worst of corporate yeah. record companies. And um, he's talking about his favorite band, The Evil Clowns. Uh, he's talking to Lorraine Newman. He's putting down Devo and he goes, you know, something about, now, The Evil Clowns, now there's a band. And it cuts to the famous uh, uh, image of David Lee Roth shot by Helmut Newton, where he's chained to a chain link fence. Yeah. Long, and we morphed 
you know, early composite, we morphed Mark's face over David Lee Roth's face. So it was not David Lee Roth, it was Mark, but with David Lee Roth's hair and body and chained. And, you know, Lorraine Pooh Poo's The Evil Clowns. And then we heard, uh, you know, maybe six months later that David Lee Roth didn't like that. <laughs> <laughs> the, the person who has a sense of humor about everyone else except themselves oh that's the way it works <laughs> well ba back to you and your awesomeness uh jerry are we allowed to know what's next where to look for your oh, am i allowed to know what's next that's how what's that's what's silly i mean um we looked out here uh as you know we we did like eight shows in um Europe, uh, uh, all over the UK and the EU, uh, that went incredibly well, and we were really well received. Frankly, because they hadn't seen us in twenty years or whatever, uh, and then we came. Uh, that was in August, and we came back to the United States, and then we did eleven shows here on the West Coast. Uh, you know, between Washington and Oregon and California in, in November, and then four days later, we flew to Australia. And we did six big shows there. And the good thing was, it's just obviously the right timing because Devo's been on ice so long that there, there we were. And people had been waiting to see us. So we were allowed to work because, you know, Mark stopped being uh, an obstructionist. He said, let's yeah. do it. And... Devo was, you know, like a Ferrari. We had to work on all cylinders. If Mark didn't want to do it, it wasn't going to work to go out without Mark. Mm -hmm. um, so we uh, we were well received, and it, and predictably it exploded. And why? Because, well, I'll tell you why. Deevolution is fucking real, okay? And people know it now more than ever. And yeah. as they dive into the new year here and face the insanity of 2024 that everyone knows is going to blow wide open. They understand that something about Debo resonates with today. We did something right that withstood the test of time. Yeah. And, and now it's not even dated. Now it's just as relevant as ever. So that's why anybody's paying attention to Debo. It's not because we sold 100 million records like Elton John, right? It's not that. It's that we had a worldview and an idea and a body of work that unfortunately predicted the yeah. future. I, I, I stick with it that the people are still paying attention to Devo because the catalog holds up. When the wife and I, th this is a really true story before I ask you two final questions and let you go. Yeah. At, at our yeah. wedding, the dance floor was dead. Uh, we curated song by song and people were like, ah, oh, yeah, great music and no one was dancing. And then you put on Whip It and the whole dance floor fills up. It's an accidental wedding song that nobody realizes is a wedding song. Then everyone danced the whole night. So, And you know what's funny is that was an accidental dance song. We we <laughs> were not like, oh, let's be a dance band. That was never Devo doing that. Um, no. We, we On that record, Freedom of Choice, we did make a kind of almost Dada humorous decision that we were going to do quote Devo R and B, which would have gone was going to be like robot James Brown or something. And and so I switched over to Mini Moog bass because of what Stevie Wonder had been doing. Mm -hmm. Right. And we hired Bob Margoloff as our producer who had worked with Stevie on his major records mm -hmm. and understood everything about recording synthesizers and uh and that led us to beats that were more r&b oriented so we weren't chopping up you know we weren't doing prog rock chopped up time signatures we weren't doing heavy rock pink pussycat kind of stuff we had a groove because we wanted to do devo grooves but we didn't realize that we'd make songs you could dance to. <laughs> yeah. And, and we did. Yeah. We made several that you could dance to. And Whip It, of course, became the hit. 
which we couldn't have predicted. The the record company put all their chips on Girl You Want and ran with that. And when that didn't happen, they were out. They were out the door. <laughs> and it was only one guy, Cal Rudman, who was a radio programmer down in the southeast in Florida, where, you know, they send these big programmers free copies of the record and say, hey, listen to this, right? Yeah. Well, he actually did. I mean, they weren't giving him cocaine or prostitutes or anything. Or yeah, paid a lot. yeah. And he listened to the record back when, you know, regional programmers had a lot of power before Clear Channel. Yeah. And he, he said, I like Whip It. Screw Girl You Want. And he started playing Whip It down there in, in Florida and the surrounding area. And he put out his Cal Rudman tip sheet, told all his DJs to go with it. They did. Within two weeks, it had run up the East Coast and made it onto a big radio station in New York City. And it changed everything. We had to stop and recalibrate the tour because we were still playing clubs and move from 400 seaters to like 2,500 seaters, 4,000 seaters, like that. Wow. Thank you, Cal. And yeah. And, and, and my two stupid questions before I let you go. First one is yeah. accidentally you said Devo on ice a few times because you're referring to inactivity. But was there ever yeah. a Devo on ice concept show like ice skating? <laughs> no, but that's a good idea. <laughs> I well, like it. I, I would love to see that if you beat the Avatar bands with the first Devo on ice That'd show. Be funny. That would be funny. Wow. With the best skaters, with the best U.S. skaters available. Yeah. I'm into that. And then the last question is being a big Josh Freese fan and, you know, loving his work in the Vandals and then Devo and then Devo blasted him open to playing with every band at the same time on the planet. Josh is obsessed with P.F. Chang's. Are you also or is he the lone Devo person who loves P.F. Chang's? Well, he he infected me with that. (laughs) He infected we We got... In one one afternoon in the Bowery Bar, in the Bowery Hotel in New York, during a uh, horrible rainstorm, we we uh, ducked in there uh, to get out of the weather, and um, it was packed, of course. And we we finally worked our way up to the bar, and um, ordered some drinks and some appetizers, and there was this, you know kind of uh, very, what would you call her? Very strident, tough, Brooklyn-esque girl with a white t-shirt, black suspenders, tight pants, kind of a goth hairdo, bartender. (laughs) Josh pulls out his (laughs) P.F. Chang card and says to me that, let me pay for this. And I'm laughing, right? And so we're both going with this. And he gives her the P.F. Chang card. And she's so busy. She's serving like 10, 12 people. And she goes and tries to use the P.F. Chang card. And of course, it won't go through. And she comes back and slaps it on the table in front of us and goes, what the fuck is this? And and him and I, unfortunately, we were so... um, proud of ourselves for being so adolescent we just burst into laughter and you know we're going we're sorry we're sorry we know we were assholes forget it sorry and we paid her in cash but she wouldn't even look at us again <laughs> but it was a uh, josh's big moment where he 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 got me into being chance in a way i couldn't even believe it was hilarious Wow. Uh, that that story, nothing's going to top that. So I'll end it on that note, Jerry. But thank you for the decades right. of excellent art visually and musically and really looking forward to what's to come and uh, hope more 4D stuff happens in the future. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, now. Outro.